much for coming this evening to the Opera House and to the launch of the John Clute Telluride Science Fiction Library. Okay. Uh, excuse me for reading this, but I care so much about this subject that I thought I might lose it if I didn't read it. All right, here we go. Since I first laid eyes on John Clute in Madame Morris's French class at Nutra High School 60 years ago, <laughs> I knew we were in for a special ride. <laughs> he entered the class as an exotic transfer from far off Canada. And from the beginning, he was transgressive and stuck his legs out into the aisles because he was too tall for the desks and refused to apologize and, as I recall, drove the very strict and prim and very French Madame Morris rather crazy. <laughs> like so many, I had gotten the, me the memo that our generation would be required to break a lot of rules, and I could see that John was a natural. And with good fortune, our lives have wound and twined together over the years in New York, London, and beyond. John and his amazing wife Judith are godparents to our kids. He is, all, he is an altogether extraordinary friend, and so on. Meanwhile, over these many years, John was creating a vast world of powerful work. We had all loved science fiction as kids. Some of us never grew out of it. John was the one who insisted that science fiction grow up right along with him. It's pretty clear that science fiction is the literature of our time as it mirrors us, stretches us, deals with our relentless acceleration, and keeps producing needed stories. But it used to operate pretty much without serious attention from the thoughtful, book-writing, university-occupying classes. Meanwhile, it invaded uh, our um, dreams and media and technologies. John Clute has, to his credit, two novels, The Disinheriting Party and Appleseed, and a number of short stories. One he reminded me is actually about Telluride. Since the 1960s, he has published five volumes. I'm going to read these statistics, but they're really more than statistics, so I'm going to like linger on the numbers. <laughs> five volumes of collected critical essays on science fiction, stories, novels, and uh, basically, you know, the, the ideas, the basic ideas. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm not finding my place. Um, s okay. These, uh, these critical essays uh, add up to over a million words. And it's almost impossible to overstate the importance as a critic and scholar of science fiction that he has had. He has pretty much single-handedly, at least until his mentees have also started to work, he has almost single-handedly uh, dragged the field out of its energetic, pulpy, pulpy chaos and genre hash and pulled forth its essential shapes, crafted its forms, delineated the grammar, illuminated it, and gave it new portals. He has given countless writers and readers great insight, pleasure, and also the tools with which to go forward. He bestrides the field like a colossus. But that is not all. He is also the field's great encyclopedist. Along with fellow editors, he has created the Science Fiction Encyclopedia. Uh, the first edition was in 1979 in print, it was a print edition, had 730,000 words, and we all thought it was long. Huh, no. The present online encyclopedia, which is free for all to consult and use, and I so much recommend it to you all if you have any curi curiosity about this great field, the, the present Encyclopedia Online is nearly five and a half million words long. 
and heavily illustrated. And John Clute himself is responsible for over 2,800,000 2, uh, words of the encyclopedia. So he is a living treasure. And his library, carefully collected and curated and cataloged over the years, is another one. It is our great pleasure, working with the Telluride Institute, to welcome this extraordinary resource, which we hope will become the center of much good work in the future. It, is long, it along with the new AHA, the Scientist Depot, and the wonderful and much longed for transfer warehouse, um, and other efforts is, I believe, part of Telluride's retrofitting into its old mining self uh, of a university of the future in our little town. And now, with great pleasure, I present my friend John Clue. I've, I've got one here. Um, I'm going to break away immediately from what I was going to say to indicate that Pamela said one thing that was not quite accurate. <laughs> there is nothing single-handed about anything I've done in my life. Certainly nothing single-handed about the um, gradual evolution of a collection of books and a bunch of essays. One of the central, <coughs> to me, one of the central inspirations for my generation of writers and critics was Pamela Zoline herself. Her great stories of the 70s. Her great stories of the 1970s and 80s before she came here and began to do a number of other things, including working on a novel which we await with very considerable anticipation. She and a few other people were absolutely central to allow me to think that science fiction itself was something that I could devote my life to as a serious guy, not just a collector. Okay, I break this into three parts and I will probably truncate a bit towards the end because Ed Finn and I will probably go over the kind of stuff I was going to babble about about the future. The first part is just the library itself. I'd like to describe it. Second part is the original title of this, of this address, which is those who do not understand SF are condemned to repeat it. And the third is, as I say, what is the job of SF? What is it that it should do, rather than what is it that it can do? So, personal memory. I think one or two of the books that I began to collect, I began to collect as a teenager. And I suspect that Pamela Zoline actually saw those books before they began to migrate. They migrated from Chicago to New York to Toronto, to London, to Toronto again, to London, and back to here over a period of almost 60 years. As they migrated, as it were, they, they acquired reasoning and argument and excuse making for spending the money and, and, and focusing time and energy on the collecting of books. I should make a distinction that those of us who like to think of ourselves as collectors, and I think I can argue that I am one, like to distinguish ourselves from accumulators. Whether or not the arguments we provide are spurious, the arguments we provide are satisfactory to us. We think we're doing something that makes sense. We think we are fighting against entry. We think we are increasing the message content of the world. So it's, to use a Marxist term, it's a praxis. It's a, it's a wedding of theory and practice. And although it's very ad hoc at times, underneath it all, there are principles that are governing the creation of a library of this sort. But, strikes me I should probably define science fiction first, because some of us here, in the best of good will, um, think of science fiction in terms distinct from what I think of science fiction. Of. I don't spend a huge much, too, too much time arguing film, although I think about it quite a bit. So the simplest definition of science fiction for me, sorry, um, 
is that a science fiction text is a text set in a world which has not happened, but which could arguably happen. That's very simple, but it has all sorts of consequences, which I'm not going to go into because this is not a lecture on the nature of science fiction as such. The term world, the term happen, and the term arguably all unpack indefinitely. <laughs> so it sounds simple and is not, but it is in a sense simple because it's not fantasy, because it's a possible world. And it's not mundane literature, it's be because it's in a world which has not happened. So, the library itself breaks down into a number of ways that one could describe its creation. It is built as a spinal cord of the significant books of science fiction, of American science fiction, and to a lesser degree, English science fiction, over the past 100 years or so. It is created, this spinal cord, by my taste and by three or four critical devices which I applied. So I would decide this book belongs in the argument, this book does not. In 1953, there was a bibliography published by a man named Crawford, who's still alive, and a few dead colleagues. It was called 333. It was a list of every single book of any interest of fantasy and science fiction that had ever been published up to the end of 1950. Of course, there are 10, 20 times as many as, as that, as we've discovered. But that spinal cord is a marker of how we've evolved our understanding of literature and evolved our access to literature. Literature used to be very hard to find. Science fiction was hard to define, hard to find, hard to locate. No longer. The Science Fiction Hall of Fame was started in 1996 and honors all of the people who have been deemed by a group of responsible jurors to be members of a Hall of Fame. Those um, figures are represented in the collection. The Hugo Awards and the Nebula Awards, similarly, they are represented in the collection. Uh, there has been, in conjunction with the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, which I have been working on almost as long as I've been working on the collection, in, co in corroboration with that, in, in, in connection with that, I have created with colleagues a list of all possible titles of the fantastic. And that list has been evolved over the last 40 years. So it's a kind of a pool of information from which I make, I draw conclusions and buy books. Okay, what books there are there actually there in this extraordinary generation starship shaped um, library. A library which is designed, as I'll probably say later again, designed to make one participate in experiencing the books. Experiencing the books not as though they're part of a library, but as though each one is an individual experience that you're going to achieve. The first thing is that with very few exceptions, all the books in the library are first editions. This is not simply to um, control collector's mania. You can't buy the book if it's a reprint, so you're saved from buying that book. It's also, it's also an argument, which I will expand on later if I have time, about the, the fact that science fiction as a whole is immensely and detailedly tied to the time and place and audience that the original publication was issued for. Probably more than any other literature in the world, science fiction is so tied. You cannot understand a science fiction story from 1940 unless you see how it came out in 1940. So, 
because they're all first editions, I do not accept an archival argument that permanent editions should be added only. I don't accept an archival argument that all forms of a particular book should be, should be represented, unless that book is of importance. The result is that, once again, unlike any other serious literature in the world, a large number of science fiction authors began their careers through the publication of mass market paperback originals. The, the most famous, maybe, the one that some I've shown now, William Gibson's Neuromancer, which has become a kind of Bible for hundreds of thousands of people, and has become timeless, except it was not timeless. It was published in a context, a visible context, in 1984, as something that could be thrown away. It was not understood until it was read that this was going to be a revolutionary assault on the old science fiction, the first science fiction I'm going to be talking about in a minute. So when you look at that book, I'm going to read a couple of titles, a couple of authors, but by no means all of them because the list is very long. Um, but the list of authors who began to publish as authors of mass market paperbacks includes um, Samuel R. Delaney, Roger Zelazny, Ursula Le Guin, Joanna Russ, James Tiptree Jr., Greg Baer, Kim Stanley Robinson, Gibson himself, Lucius Shepard, Pat Murphy, Karen Joy Fowler, and last but absolutely not least, um, because her book was published at the very end of a period when paperback, mass market paperback originals meant anything, uh, my partner Elizabeth Hand, whose 1991st novel was a mass market paperback original. So what we have there is a unique shape, and that unique shape, I felt, had to be characterized and made evident in the library. So, as you will find out, it, it is so done. Another consequence of the, of the decision to focus on this kind of track through is the small number of doublings altogether. Most of the books on, in the library, there will be 12,000 eventually, 8,000 are waiting to be shipped when the, when the, when the starship is constructed. Very few duplicates in all those books. All SFE authors are represented that I can find. SFE meaning the encyclopedia. If I write an entry on an author, I attempt to have a book by the author. This is not always possible. I am going to have to stop for a second and get some water to soothe the altitude afflicted throat I got. When I was young, it seemed to take only a day or so to adjust to being in Telluride. But I'm, I'm panting. <laughs> and it's been two or three days. But it's also 50 years later. So. OK, the books are stacked in a particular way to exemplify all these arguments. They are stacked chronologically by author. And within each, no, sorry, alphabetically by author. But chronologically, within each author's stack of books, they are presented in chronological order, so that at a glance, you can begin to get the story of time flowing through an author's career and time flowing through the actual history of the genre. There's a catalog, which I have created from a card catalog. I began in the 1970s, but is now searchable. and narrates the books in a fashion which might seem to be transgressive. And indeed, it is transgressive. The argument about science fiction I have overall has tended to be transgressive in one, that it takes it seriously, and two, that it holds it very, very much to account for what it has done 
to itself and to us as an enterprise. So the catalog is searchable and can be used to um, gain access to any of the books in the library. This is what you'd expect and this is what you get. One of the things that you learn from beginning to collect and realizing that books with dust jackets tend to be more expensive is that not only is it a good idea to buy a book with a dust jacket, but it is an essential kind of component in your creation of the story of that book. On Facebook, I've been doing a series I've been calling Annals of Vandalism with the British Library, a continuing series. It has been a series of descriptions of, of books, usually the books I had in my own collection because it was easy to photograph them, and showing the difference between that book without a dust jacket, which is how the British Library stacks its books, and that book with the dust jacket, with the joy of the illustration, with the context of the illustration, with the dust jacket copy, much frequently written actually by the authors themselves, certainly in earlier years, biographical information, series information, all that information, which to my mind is an inherent part, an inherent bibliographical part of the description of a book, is absolutely not what the British Library and any library of record which follows its model considers to be a real book. So the library here is constructed out of a transgressive understanding, a transgressive bibliographical understanding of what a book is. And I think I'm right. <laughs> I, think, I think we can unpack at great length and very enjoyably what is lost from the stripping of particular individual titles particularly titles before, say, World War II, when so many dust jackets were destroyed in paper drives, etc., in England, that it's very hard to find um, dust jackets and popular books from before that period. But every time I find one, I add, I modify an entry in the encyclopedia because I found out something I didn't know. So that's transgressive. It's transgressive as well to have an open plan library that looks like this. Archival libraries are not, they don't intend not to look like this, but none of their prerogatives lead them to make their stacks look like this. Their stacks are not meant to be seen. Their stacks are meant to contain items which themselves contain information. The catalogs are therefore designed to point the researcher to a piece of information. The book itself is, in some standard catalogs, is almost a veil between the researcher and the information. I don't believe the veil is a good model for archival libraries dedicated to living literatures, which is why almost every book there in the, in the library is dust jacketed and is told, narrated, made visible in a particular way that when you go along the shelves, you're being told stories. You're being asked to go and look at this, but look at this next one. I'm sorry, this, this is really testing my lungs. So, we have this and we have through this, a portrait of American SF, which you will be able to look at at great length when you wish to do so. But at the same time, because I live in England, I've been able to acquire some other books. Now, the four books I will put behind me are scientific romances set in the future, written in the 1930s by British authors. William. <coughs> <clears throat> William Lamb is a woman, Storm Jameson. Uh, nobody knows why she published this particular book under this name. Each of these books 
and I'm anticipating, each of these books represents an, a European, British, peace between two wars kind of attitude towards the future. Each of them is about something like World War II. Each of them is a disaster novel. Each of them has relatively little hope for the future. That is, that I think is one of the most marvelous 1930s covers. <laughs> this is a, this is the only facsimile dust jacket in the library. The book itself is exceedingly expensive with the original dust jacket and um, half my annual income. And, and I, I decided in this instant to buy a substitute jacket that's clearly marked when you open it up. But that is, a, is one of the rare novels of the time because most of the stock almost certainly was destroyed when the Blitz hit London. This is published in late 39. So there are very few copies of it around. But it tells the story. This is a scientific romance, which is a kind of a comedy, except that as you read further and further, you understand that all these activities of human beings are leading them into another disaster of the same sort. So that is a kind of an excursus, an intermission. So I'm not spending most of my time, obviously, talking about the contents of individual books. But we have here in Telluride a library of scientific romances. And I'd be really rather thrilled if some researchers started making use of the full bibliographical book, not just some kind of resume or facsimile of the book, like the British Library and some archival libraries provide. So that's an argument for the centrality of this small collection. So, what it all adds up to is a portrait of science fiction, American science fiction, and, <coughs> and through the dust jackets, through the persistence I have established in, in having first editions only, we can develop a portrait of what the literature, a literature that we loved and love, actually did see what it actually was talking about. Because science fiction before 1950 or so was not talking about the kind of world we live in now or understand. We're familiar with it through bad movies and through rereading novels, but we are not, we don't really get it until we immerse ourselves in this in this strangeness, this strangeness of the past. And it is, and maybe that is the central collector's longing that I have to find another book which exemplifies the strangeness of the past, the, the, the thingness of it. It's there, it's doing something different, and it's in your face if you only look. There's something uncanny about a book whose existence in literal and in literary terms lasts, has gone on for the last 80 years or 90 years. It's as though there's something, something demanding to be heard, some ghost demanding justice. And that justice is what we try to provide by reading the book in context and seeing with all warts what was going on. There is a way in which science fiction can be excused for being so unutterably stupid at times, so unutterably unable to configure a world that we could live in with, with any comfort. Um, I've used the term fantastica to describe non-mimetic literatures, non-realistic literatures of all sorts from about 1800. There are a general range of stories which, which is sensitive to the fact that we're living on a planet, stories which are, are new to the world in that they take marvels literally. They, they're not metaphorical stories. They're stories in which the metaphors follow the reality. Um, they, are, they are 
they were they did not create, but in a sense they were in at the birth of the plant as a concern. They were in at the birth of the Anthropocene. They're transgressive against owners, except in the 19th century, if you happen to be white. Then they were not transgressive. But science fiction novels are harder versions of, of fantasy and horror. Uh, they, they do the job in a different way. You might call them what, the Spanish Inquisition of Fantastica. They cut, too, they cut deep, but they cut too deep. And they reveal things. So I attempted here to draw a short list of characteristics which we might recognize of first science fiction. The first thing is that it's first world science fiction. It's stories that are set from the viewpoint of the first world, of the, of the world that is in control of other worlds. It is, of course, white. It is, of course, male. It is, more surprisingly perhaps, rural. First science fiction did not really much like the city. It was written usually by people from small towns, and the city was far too dangerous, complex, and full of the wrong kind of people to make a good adventure story in which a hero, white, male, conquered the universe, invented the cure for whatever. Science fiction of this first order did not much, therefore, like democracies. There are numerous world states before World War II in American science fiction, but very, very few of them even remotely are democratic because democracy doesn't work. A hero cannot, as it were, levitate his legion into the stars if he has to go through bureaucracy to do so. The, the decisions to, de to defend Terra or the Earth or us, Homo sapiens, have to be taken on the spur by heroes. So there's no point in having a democracy back there which will befuddle everybody. Which all of which leads up to questions as to why this happens. Why did American science fiction between the wars have this particular purity and strength? I think one of the answers is that it was written for and written by engineers. American science fiction before the time of um, troubles, when the the Cold War began to dissolve into a multipolar Cold War. American science fiction tended to think of how to deal with the future as a series of engineering problems, as a series of problems about something which existed which could be solved by a series of responsible decisions to continue doing something better. So if we're overcrowded, we build spaceships and go to the stars. The deadly thing, of course, is that engineers <coughs> are required by their, by their engineering degrees, as it were, to solve, problems which, to solve problems which already exist. They are not asked to, they're not invited to, and they are not very likely to be allowed to publish stories in which the linear exploration of the future does not lead to anything but chaos. So, you have American science fiction, which had this sense that you could solve problems, and American science fiction in the 1920s and 1930s paid almost no attention to the possibility of World War II. It hardly existed in, in the literature of American science fiction. In the science fictions in other countries, it not only existed, but dominated. American science fiction, having learned that lesson after World War II, began to predict World War III very quickly. And there are hundreds of 
stories which predict World War III, sometimes nuclear, sometimes not. But World War III, of course, didn't happen. And that it didn't happen for a very complicated set of reasons, which we as writers and collectors and citizens are beginning to understand and want praise. So, if you have a solution which solves, you don't have what the philosopher David Dennett describes as sort of happenings. He uses the term to apply the evolution of intelligence, which is one of the real bugbears of science fiction as a whole, because the evolution of intelligence can be seen to end in us, or it can be seen to end in self-conscious AIs. But David Dennett suggests that we're not going to have that kind of easy progression. We're going to have what you might call sort of conscious singularities of things. They're as conscious as they need to be, but they're not self-conscious. This was hard to predict from a, a linear standpoint, and it, and it didn't happen. The predictions were not made. One of the um, classic examples of how linear science fiction after World War II did not capture what was happening to us and is still happening to us um, can be told through an anecdote which many of us may know. Um, the film Chinatown was designed as the first part of a trilogy, very roughly. Never really happened. The second volume of the two Jakes um, was a failure. The trilogy was going to be based on three problems that America was facing. Ecological, environmental, governmental problems. The first problem was water. The second problem in the two Jakes was power, oil. Third problem was going to be transportation. And that film was never made until in 1987 some filmmakers realized that they had a good story here. Why don't we make it into a cartoon? And so the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is a counterfactual film, not only because it's got tunes rather than people, was generated as an answer to the problem of transportation. And if you remember how the film ends, the film ends with the defeat of the attempt of the villainous, um, um, I forget what they're called, they're, they're the bad tunes, to build six-lane expressways through the heart of Los Angeles. The film is set in 1949. We see a shot of trolleys, trams going up and down the street, a peaceful urban street, and the film ends. That is as close as American science fiction seemed to get before recent years to the problem of what, what has happened to us as a mobile culture with the astonishing convulsive triumph of the automobile. It was not predicted. I did a sort of very informal survey um, several years ago. Um, it was never published and it was never complete, but it taught me enough, I think. It was indicative enough. I asked a number of people if they could tell me of a, any American story written between 1930 and maybe 1965 or 1970, which showed a traffic jam. There were none. There might have been the occasional traffic jam caused by a, a net A bomb or by Godzilla, but I, I exempted them. There were no traffic jams. There was no sense that the linear explosion of the automobile would have multifarious side effects. And nor was it the kind of thing that science fiction writers wanted to declare. It's very important to remember what, what passions are un underlie the writing of stories which may not seem to be as intelligent as the person who wrote them. If they're doing that, if a writer is doing that in a genre or any other kind of context, 
there is an operation going on. It may just be pure commerce. Somebody needs money, so they write something stupid. But with science fiction as a whole, what we need to learn from science fiction is why authors, in their large numbers, wrote more simply than they knew. Why would you have a science fiction full of Robert Moses figures building highways, but no Jane Jacobs at all? There's, there are reasons underlying all of this. And when we go down to what science fiction as a genre in 1945, 50, 55 or so did not actually see at all, then we begin to understand that there are underlying reasons over and above just engineering. What science fiction didn't see was transistors, miniaturization, computers rather than robots, wheels, the wheels of the internet. It did not perceive that we might become, as one might put it, parishioners of these magical tools that we were creating. And it did not want to see these things. So what does, to go to part three finally, and I'm, I'm going over my time now, so I'm going to go very, very short, because I think we can have a discussion subsequently. What should modern science fiction be doing? What it should not be, in my view, is, to use a term, homo sapiens compliant. We have gotten too far into this century to really enjoy, except when we're feeling very, very, very relaxed, homo sapiens compliant stories. Um, a homo sapiens compliant story is a story, for instance, and Dan Collins and I may have something to say about this, in which 3D printers are treated primarily as games as toys. Dan himself right, makes serious art and has for a quarter of a century from 3D printers. But there is an argument, and a fairly obvious argument, for a speculative writer that a machine which can not only repeat, print what is, it is ordered to print, but can learn from what it is printing and from the world outside to modify its own instructions, that this may be a radical transform of the world, and one that is not honored when modern science fiction writers treat them as things to wrap parcels with or toys for children. So, to go back, it is Homo sapiens compliant to believe that artificial intelligences, machines, whatever kind of symbol you might want to use for the, this huge, vast internet, that they want to become like us. They don't want anything. They become more intelligent. They are sort of conscious. But there is no evidence whatsoever, despite movies like Her or, um, what was that other one? Don't remember the name. Um, um, Ex Machina, in which you can see that the, the deeply frightening thing about a, an AI is that it may be able to pass the Turing test. Well, I suspect that most complex networks at the moment can pass Turing tests. It's not, it's not their point. They're not, they, they, we didn't design them for that. It's an illusion of our fiction and our daydreams that we designed our machines to be like us. We design them to do what we can't do yet, or maybe never. That's a very different thing. Niche species, Homo sapiens comply <coughs> compliant. I said, I'm I apologize for this. It's. I hope it does. I mean, I'd really feel embarrassed if I was the first to introduce this kind of voice. And when your voice cracks on you, your, your idea cracks. 
but not all of them. I've, I'm, I'm more or less, I'm more or less at the end of where I want to be before we, we do, before we have a bit of a, of a conversation. So maybe a final presumption of Homo sapiens compliant SF is that in the end, it will somehow be important enough for us to work out with the help of our trillion machines a habitat around Mercury or Jupiter that at huge cost can take care, supply, keep alive a, a batch of quarreling meat puppets. <laughs> right. It's not in the books. We are not going to explore, invade, conquer space, except as the guests of our own machines. But that doesn't make for a very good story. Nor does, nor does the 3D machine printer make for a very good story. The problem with these, these non-homo sapiens compliant ideas is that once you activate them, you've almost guaranteed to make the story you want to write almost impossible. A 3D a printer, in the end, is an engine which makes complexity basically free. Most of the problems of the most of the stories written over most of the centuries on our planet are stories about scarcity, being defeated by it, solving it, working some way to escape it. Those stories are becoming quaint in our world. And the same thing, as I was saying, with the assumption that the future will be shaped around a sort of, a sort of unspoken assumption that we make that we're too cuddly, too lovable for our AIs to, to abandon completely. We may be, because we are, we are intoxicatingly complicated, inconsistent, incoherent, interesting, inventive creatures. But that is not to say that we're necessary. <laughs> so we go back to the library. There is an argument about the modern world which, which makes it very clear that it is easy to think that most of what we do tends these days to be seen in terms of transactions, in terms of making aspects of ourselves and behavior portable and, and monetizable. Um, the usual term is used is fungible, that when X, which is what you started with, is, is translated into Y, what is lost in that translation, because that translation can only translate what it defines as being there. What is left is something a bit less than the original. I use the term taken and distorted from a writer, Chris Priest, who now published a novel called The Prestige. And I use the term prestige to describe that essence, that that flavor, that something, that context, that beingness that was lost in any fungible transaction. And as most of the transactions we make, like being barcoded to board a plane, are fungible transactions, we are constantly being translated into additions that don't actually add up to what we, what we used to be. So, Obviously, the library itself is an attempt to defeat this sort of transcendence, to defeat this sort of gradual loss of individual thingness into negotiated items of non-being. My sense of most other libraries is that they've already made the move and that most libraries are transactional in a sense. Our library here is not. It is a library in which I've attempted more and more consciously over the years to save the prestige. 
to save the prestige of our, our minds, our thoughts, our beings, our books, what we do, what we touch, what we love. And that's why I'm so happy the library is here. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful, John. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to shift the stage around a little bit. Uh, my name is Dan Collins. I'm the president of the board of the Telluride Institute. And I want to welcome you again to this wonderful event. Uh, this is our latest project, the John Clute Science Fiction Library. We're so pleased. Um, so as soon as I heard that uh, Pam and John were going to bring the library to Telluride, I had one thought, Ed Finn. <laughs> so Ed Finn is a long-term colleague of mine at Arizona State University where I've taught for the last 30 years, believe it or not. And um, he's extraordinarily qualified to interview Mr. Clute, and that's what we're going to do next. So. Um, Flynn is conversant in the history of literature, the arts, the sciences, engineering, and of course, science fiction. So here's the boilerplate on Dr. Finn. Oh, you're already there on the stage. He's the founding director of the Center for Science and the Imagination, isn't that a great name, at Arizona State University, where he is a professor in the School of Arts, Media, and Engineering, and the Department of English. He also serves as the Academic Director of Future Tense, a partnership between ASU, New America, and Slate Magazine, and as co-director of Emerge, an annual festival of art, ideas, and the future, Ed's research and teaching explore digital, narratives, creative collaboration, and the intersection of the humanities, arts, and sciences. He is also an author. Uh, in 2014, he published Hieroglyph, colon, Stories and Visions for a Better Future. And most recently, in the spring of 2017, he just came out with a, press, uh, a book on MIT Press called What Algorithms Want? Imagination in the Age of Computing. You get the Freudian gloss, I guess, right? Okay. Good. Um, and he, yeah, he co-edited just recently, also released by MIT Press in 2017, um, a book called Frankenstein, colon, annotated for scientists, engineers, and creators of all kinds. He completed his PhD in English and American literature at Stanford in 2011, and his bachelor's degree at Princeton in 2002. And before graduate school, Ed worked as a journalist at Time, Slate, and, wait for it, Popular Science. So, welcome at Finn. Thank you, thank you, Dan, for that embarrassingly long introduction. And thank you uh, to the Institute and uh, to John for allowing me to share the stage with him. Uh, and uh, how, how lucky are we to be in this beautiful place? Uh, I think exceedingly lucky. Yeah. I was last year, 30 years ago, when it was valiant, but clearly needing a lot of money and a lot of love to survive, and that money and that love has transparently been applied. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful venue. I love it. Yeah. So uh, I want to. I, I think maybe we'll talk for maybe 20, 20, 25 minutes, something like that, and open it up for questions. Uh, so uh, uh, hang in there. Um, I want to start with pick up really where, where you ended off, uh, and I really love the 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 way you talked about the strangeness of the past and the, the specificity, the power of these material objects. And books are 
magnificent in part because they're mortal just like us and they bear the scars of their passage through time and that's part of what makes them uh, so, so much fun to, to own and to share and to inscribe. Um, and it strikes me that there's an interesting uh, corollary to the role of science fiction in exploring the strangeness of the future. And I'm really interested in this, this notion of homo sapiens compliance that you're talking about. Because of course science fiction is a, is a genre, it's a, it's a literature, it's a thing that humans do to try and explain the world. And like all literature, it's a, it's a mechanism we have for trying to escape our own bodies and our minds and yeah. pretend that yeah. we are telepathic and that we can travel through space and time. And so, uh, how do you, what, what, what do you think the, the role of science fiction is in the world? Well, it certainly isn't to instruct. I think science fiction makes a huge error when it tends to instruct, when it ten, attempts to make into dramatic form outcomes which we might deem favorable or sustainable or world peace kill. Um, we don't, I don't think, I don't think science fiction as a, as a literature is well designed to do that. And I think a lot of the terrible books and possibly terrible actions that have been engaged upon by people persuaded by those books has come from, a, from that central fact that science fiction is a form of story, and story has a, has, is, does not like good news, it can't handle good news. Story is designed to find out something wrong, to cite something wrong, and to, and to follow a path through the wrongness, possibly to a good outcome. But the outcome is where it ends, it's not where it, a, a, a story begins. So my, one of my problems with most of the attempts to write wholesome science fiction is that they're crap fiction. And they're inherently crap fiction, despite the intelligence, the ardor, the love of the people writing them, and, and the desire to describe in dramatic terms um, sustainability. So this is always at risk uh, when you're really using literature as a kind of propaganda, right? What, however noble of course. The, uh, the objective might be. Um, on the other hand, I think there's, there's, some, there's, there's an aesthetic at play too, right? Literature is about the beautiful. And so the problems can be beautiful and the path through the problems can be beautiful. And so I agree with you. I don't think that science fiction's role is to instruct us. Uh, there, that's when you get into the scary realm of propaganda and you're actually shutting down people's freedom of thought. Yeah, yeah. But, there's a, but the expanding freedom of thought, that's really important and that's a role that science fiction can play well. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a really, really difficult thing to work out how that is going to happen. Um, how, how you can conceive, publish, um, make available stories that actually work as fiction about the enhancement of life on the planet. Um, science fiction has had two problems. One is that, uh, that it has not been understood to be a, 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 a literature which was not easily designed to do this. Um, the other um, side of it, of course, is that it's exactly the same thing. Nobody understands that's the case. Therefore, science fiction authors get embroiled in and advocate kinds of, of magical, magical solutions generated by story, which, which, which are not actually going to um, necessarily and very frequently, give us openings. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, if you go back to the, your original um, question, so science fiction's task is not to direct, not to predict, not to give a, a, a linear outcome. Um, Stan Robinson, Kim Stanley Robinson, our, his last um, novel, New York 2340, 2140, is a marvelous thought experiment written by an exceedingly exper experienced and sophisticated author who knew he was eliminating most of the, of the consequences of what's happening to us right now in order to, to tell us how we could solve a particular problem. And that might be, for a sophisticated author and a sophisticated audience, one of the one of the routes through. We are writing a story in the knowledge that there are no printed buildings, there's no internet, there's no this or that, but 
there's a huge amount of, amount of interesting stuff about global warming and how a city like Manhattan would handle 50 feet up rise in the ocean levels. Fascinating. But it has to be, it has to be, it has to be limited. I don't think we're going to get a, a Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk of science fiction that, that gives us all. I hope not. That we'd have, we'd no, have both pronounce it twice is enough. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed your, your review of 2140. Uh, yeah. And it, it got me thinking about this notion of, of simplification. Uh, Stan agreed with it, by the way. He thought it was funny. Good. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Because then he knew what he was doing. It wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't getting at him. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, of course, the other big piece of that novel was the thing that he was trying to keep in and that he was willing to throw lots of things overboard in order to keep central to the novel was not just uh, global warming, but capitalism. And how yeah. could you deal with you know, the, this, this problem that in many ways is just a large effect of capitalism. Everybody, you know, they the sort of, what, what is the word? Externalized costs, right? Uh, yes. So very, his, his novel is very interesting mix of a sort of architecture and a sort of romance of New York and a Dos Passos novel and yep. uh, Thomas Piketty, right? Uh, and this, this say like, well, maybe we need to take a step back and really ask ourselves how we deal with these big global issues. And so it's a simplification um, and an ideal, it's, it, you know, as, as all of Stan's novels are, it's an, it's an idealistic novel. Yeah. And I, I, as I say, I thought it very, very attractive. And I thought, it, and it made me think about how do you write science fiction? In, the, in, the, in this world, and it's a, it's a good answer. Certainly if you try to write science fiction about how things are changing and how to change them. I didn't fully accept the idea that selling short in a particular industry was going to end neo, neo, neoliberalism and bring back um, um, state control over banks. But I liked the idea, and it was, a, it was a great idea to have, and this was at least somebody saying, why don't we think about the possibility of doing this, even though we know the world is desperately too complex and corrupt for this actually to happen. If you bring all the other ingredients in, you feed all the poisons back into the story, and the story dies. Right. So I see Robinson's work as one of the great, you know, his whole sort of uh, oeuvre over time has been about this celebration of possibility. The novel isn't saying, hey, I found the secret recipe. This is how we're going to solve this problem. You know, it's not a blueprint. It's an exercise in possibility thinking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's an entirely um, understandable and admirable form of, of, of literature. But in a sense, um, Dr. Stan would not think of it as being a full novel. So that's very interesting. Uh, I think it opens up this question of the sort of the, whether, whether uh, the arts in general have this kind of responsibility to society. Uh, and I think writers like Robinson or say Paolo Bacigalupi uh, think of their work quite explicitly in that way. And they're, they're writing books that they're, through which they're trying to change the world in some way. I haven't read much of the recent Bacigalupi novels and stories, but the earlier ones um, so, sort of modified the, the Stan Robinson model by, by in placing it, their characters in positions where there was less that they could do. So that you had more of a portrait of, you had more of a multiplex portrait of the consequences of, of um, I forget what it was that caused the, um, the, um, the gradual transformation, there was no oil left, et cetera, in the, uh, in the, in the famous one, the, the Winged Dead Girl. I can't remember her titles. I'm just uh, the, the Wind Up Girl, yeah. Yeah, that wasn't it. The, yeah. wind, the wind Up Girl, right? Yeah. The Wind Up Girl, yeah. Um, to go on with the answer, but this is, I wanted to make sure that you understand that um, I had made it clear before we started talking that it was not really going to be an interview but a discussion. These are not long questions that he's sneaking in. This is the discussion that we agreed to have. <laughs> yes, um, I'm glad you clarified that. Well, uh, so, uh, this, so this, the, 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 this, okay, now I'm asking you the one question I warned okay. you about beforehand, which is, do you think that the, the, this, this whole relationship of the field to society has changed over time? Is there a historical trajectory to science fiction? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 
science fiction is we commit American science fiction at the, at the at the moment because the other science fictions were very were very different in their um, in their um, relationship to government relationship to the future. American science fiction really was for many years conceived of by, by its more serious practitioners as a set of arguments about a predictable future that in more cases than not they were advocating. So it was an, it was an advocacy. Um, there was relatively little dreadful warning in American science fiction except as an incipit to get on with the job of creating a future history. If you go to, as I said before, about European science fiction, the European scientific romance um, did, not, did not do this very much. It did not, it didn't, it was not hero oriented, so the hero theory of, of how history has changed was, as it were, undercut from the get-go because its, its protagonists tend to be observers rather than doers. And there was a sense that evolution was far more important than um, social Darwinism. Uh, yeah, and I think that uh, question of the, the ways in which novels create models of a possible world, you know, a universe, uh, and whether in the classic American style that uh, a, a dowdy yeah. bandit, I think it's, it's all right, just a little water. Yeah. The, the air could use more water around here. Um, the, you know, a, 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 a dowdy band of outsiders or hackers or, or you know, uh, uh, re revolutionaries is going to upend the system and change the system of the world into something better. That's the American version. Or whether it's the European version where you're just observing the strange, beautiful universe that you've created. Uh, like like the time machine by Wells. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what exactly what I was thinking. Paradigm of scientific romance, which yeah. would not have been written by an American. Eh? But they're but they're both these. Edison's sort of Conquest of Mars is exactly contemporary. <laughs> yeah. By um, Garrett Service. Um, but yeah, there's this sort of uh, this this modeling of a possible future, right? And I think one of the interesting things we're seeing now. I, I love the the. Gibson Neuromancer, and, and Gibson has said that the, the futures that he's writing about felt like they kept becoming more and more like the present, you know, and yeah. I think we're now at a stage where uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to tell what is real <laughs> yeah. and what, what parts of the world are science fictional uh, and what parts of the world are realistic. So mm -hmm. do you see this, do you, do you, do you, would, would you speculate at all about how you might see the genre evolve in the future? I wouldn't expect to speculate a great deal because I don't think I, I would do a very good job of it, and I don't really think anybody has yet. I, I think science fiction as a as a genre has, in a sense, dissolved in any case into what I'd almost like to call recognition fiction, um, fiction that recognizes the state of the planet one way or another. Not maybe not the the eyeglass fixed on the horizon, which is rushing towards you, but always. It's 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 fiction, which is which, whose more humble task is not to create the future, but recognize how the futures are inter interspersing. As Bill Gibson says, it's, there are the futures with us, it's just not equally distributed. Um, this this kind of understanding that that some of some of our some of our lives are are led in terms that are incompatible with other parts of our own biological lives is something that science fiction will recognize. But to suggest that a science fictional virtual reality paradise is the way science fiction should go, rather than just some, um, as it were, quasi um, homo sapiens compliant um, 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 something you can suck while you're, um, while you're drowning. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a. I don't have a real answer, except that it is recognition. It is great science fiction stories now come closer to the present than other stories. It makes me think of, of Frankenstein, which is you know. Which you just edited. I, d I did with with others, tremendous colleagues. Uh, so it's it's been on my mind a lot. But that's really a a, a science fiction story about what happens when you don't recognize the. The, 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 when, you, when, you, when you don't have that recognition of, of the strange, new, unfamiliar thing you've created, and you don't take responsibility for it. You don't take responsibility for your create, creative Are acts. you speaking of the Baron, or are you speaking of Mary Shelley, or both? Uh, I'm speaking more of Victor. Yeah. I think Mary uh, was 
she, she took responsibility. I think she had good reasons yeah. for not putting her name on the first edition of the novel. If that's what you. We were, were talking about this <laughs> earlier today, a couple of us, and I was saying that, as far as I could recollect, almost all novels were anonymous at that point. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. for Victor, but right? she was fairly easily recognizable. I think within within a year or so, everybody people knew who figured she was. it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but you know, this is a, this is a, a story about somebody who creates this creature and turns that creature into a monster through his, his neglect and his own selfishness and fears. Yes, yes. Uh, He's one of the most despicable characters in all literature. Yeah. yeah. It's, from, it's a very Baron, strange book. The, 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 the Frankenstein monster does terrible things, but he's such a, such a lesson to us. And you know, the, the, the underlying radicalism of, the, of, of how he begins to become a conscious human being, he learns Western civilization by eavesdropping at a window, which is to say that all your hierarchies are nonsense. All this stuff about you, you can do this, you can do that, you can't do this, this is the proper sort, this is the improper sort, it's all nonsense. All you have to do is eavesdrop and you can master all that crap we do to make ourselves look civilized. That was, that was very, that's very arousing. Yeah, well one of, one of the many great revolutionary ideas in the book, which was written in the, in the shadow of the French Revolution. Uh, so my, well, my question that I wanted to pose out of that is, can science fiction help us become more uh, sympathetic to the future? Can it help us to recognize the strange new things in a way that is positive rather than uh, sort of uh, s s stereotyping us into only certain kinds of thinking? You're, you aren't you importing intention here? You, I am intending to make it look good, what I recognize, or I am intending to recognize the good, but it does seem that it's increasingly difficult for most authors and um, people like Cory Doctorow and Stan Robinson and a lot of writers who have had records of arguing for, let us, recognition, let us make a good recognition of how to make Mars into a place to live. They're not writing that kind of novel any longer. It's it's a much it's an exceedingly difficult time, certainly for you lucky Americans who have a new president. Um, it is a, it, We're so proud. It is an it, it is it is an exceedingly difficult time to write future about. So okay, my last question since we brought up this question of of the argument of the text, you also said something wonderful uh, that, that the argument of the archive about the argument of the archive. So what would you say is the argument of the archive? Well, I think that I spent most of the time um, this, this talk, and I do apologize for my voice. It really was buggering me up um, in arguing that this generation starship, which is what it means is that this is a place where living, the living past that we have left is still in the present. It's there for us to to obtain um, the shape of that um, projection, the accessibility of the books, the chiaroscuro or the institutional light, the institutional light saying, you, you book add up to that and everything else, the prestige I wash out with my, as it were, the cleanly the import from Down Valley. Um, the library's basic intention is to make you see. And I don't know what you're going to see, except I'm doing everything I can to make it possible for me to see what I look at and for anyone else to see what words mean, when they meant. Get that haunting, intense presentness of another time. And I think that's a really significant thing that science fiction literature, which is so exposed all the time because they're always talking about change, always talking about different times, you know, as it exposes its underpants, it exposes, it exposes the, the real thing there. Well, having exposed our underpants, now it is your turn. Uh, let's open this up for some questions. I think that notion, what, what do you see? You know, what do you hear? I'm gonna, I have a mic here and I'm gonna bring it around. But I have, I have a first question and, th and that is, something I left out of my little introduction, which already went on too long, was your intention, Pam, in terms of this being a shared resource for the community. I wonder if you could just comment on that very briefly. Okay. Well, well, I am not 
um, alone or original in saying I think we are facing difficult, uh, surprising, challenging times. Um, I will slightly disagree with my great friend, teacher, and mentor, John Clute, when I say that I think, <laughs> to some degree, science fiction uh, engages in thought experiments, so there are a bunch of world possibilities that we actually don't have to try out, because we know there, uh, there are just still children here. We know they are totally screwed. Um, and, I, and I think that, that the future of the world to some degree depends upon the integrity of communities who keep their water pure, who keep their food happening, and who keep their minds alive and active and critical. And I think that books, uh, maybe especially physical books, because it's harder to tamper with them um, without no people noticing, uh, are going to be uh, an anti-entropic um, resource during the what might be a series of cold winters ahead. Hey there, thank you so much. I'm Sarah Holbrook and I run the Pinhead Institute, um, which is science, technology, engineering, and math education for kids. And I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind just mentioning a couple of authors or titles that you think our kids uh, should read. Uh, well, you already mentioned Paolo. Yeah. Paolo Bacigalupi writes adult novels and young adult novels. If, if you're thinking about readers from 10, 10 11, 12, up, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's a very very strong writer with a, what we call a, a dark ecological consciousness, which he's able to make palatable for children. Yeah. Uh, some of the writers that uh, we've worked with at the center, I think, are, are doing really interesting stuff. So Cory Doctorow, uh, who has come up before, also writes young adult fiction uh, and is a, is a real advocate for uh, technological literacy, but also social and activist literacy, so understanding the politics around the tools that you're using, and he's, uh, I would also strongly recommend uh, his work. Uh, and there are writers uh, uh, like Madeline Ashby who are, are doing really interesting stuff. Uh, she and uh, Margaret Atwood just co-authored a piece of short fiction I haven't had a chance to read yet, but uh, uh, people who are, who are really thinking about, um, especially stories about and uh, for young people uh, in, in the near future? Um, for um, someone who's not exactly a science fiction writer, but he's a cosmological writer, and he has impassioned views as to how we got where we have gotten and become, uh, Philip Pullman. And he can, for, for your younger readers, uh, there are several books that he has written which are which are Pullman-esque books, but can be easily, easily um, attractive. And then the more, the bigger, heavier ones are, are, are engrossing. Once, once the kid is convinced that this, this man is to be trusted, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which I guess is a, something that any young adult writer has to be, has to confront, making, making himself or herself trusted enough to, to be read by somebody who's young enough to be very suspicious at times. Where do you think um, science fiction writing fits in the evolution of human consciousness? Uh, <laughs> you go first. Um, well, um, first, um, catch your consciousness. Um, catch the point in evolution um, that um, we can define as the point at which we have reached as a particular niche species, a particular level of consciousness. And then I would, I would have thought, because it's what I always think, and so I don't, you know, I'm too tired to have a different thought, I'm too old. Um, I'm, I think that, that we need to understand that the notion of evolution as something which is directed and that is in itself a homo sapiens compliant fallacy. And that 
science fiction should be in a position, because it is a cognitively explorative genre and it is inherently transgressive against the owners, against, the, against those who occupy the thrones of intellectual or religious or political power. It should be very, very relevant to us now because now is a time when we are very much on the cusp of having to understand who and what we are, and it's, it's not going to be an easy understanding. Yeah, I think uh, one, one of the layers of consciousness is starting to be reflexive about being conscious, right? And one way to think about science fiction is as the, gen the genre we, that, that emerged out of our increasing reflection on the relationship between ourselves and our tools, the humanity and uh, first we shape our tools and then our tools shape us and that science fiction is the literature that worries about that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed, particularly as a, both a scholar and a, and a mom, um, this defense of the book <laughs> and how important it is, and to the library itself. And I had a question, kind of that probably could be answered elsewhere. But what is the earliest date and the most recent date of the items that you have in the collection? Just for my own. Um, the, um, <coughs> I mean, the original kind of a first edition sort of thing. I have critical editions of some of the earliest. Um, Proto SF books from the 17th, 18th century, but um, the way the, li the, the focus of the library beyond the first edition starts um, about 1820 with a novel called Armata, whose author I cannot remember. It's not a terribly important book. Um, from, from a little bit later on in the 19th century, except for a couple of books I could not afford, but which are available um, with enough money. Um, I have basically all the, all the, all the high points of 19th century, 20th century literature, and the, the most recent book that is there was published a few days ago. If you have, I don't, I have not stopped trying to trying to shape it. I will be um, dumping books like Mana on the heads of of the new owners um, as long as I'm alive. I I just witnessed the latest edition just yesterday when uh, Ed. Signed a copy of his uh, his his most recent book, Spring 2017, and and Clute immediately added it to the library. So, well, I added the library. I had them dedicated to the library. It's <laughs> the the uh, the the first books to actually be given to the library as a library. Best thing that's happened to that book ever. <laughs> it was published yesterday. Question back here. Hi. Thank you both so much. Um, as a current scholar, I was wondering how soon this collection will be available and how do we access it? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. How soon when can we get to the books? <laughs> I would be happy over the next week to show select tiny cores of people around. Uh, we can probably talk about it on the phone through um, the Institute telephone. Um, but at the moment, the, the library is only about, there are only about 3,500 books there, mostly the alphabet from A to E. Um, about four times as many are awaiting shipment from London and will be shipped as soon as the construction work um, for, the, for this. We have blueprints which are make it very clear how this will work. So when that construction is done, which is going to take at least, I figure, 18 months, and it may take longer because it's so difficult to do anything in a simple fashion with laws and with, with acts of God. After that's done, after that's done, the books will be transported and they'll be shelved. And the whole point of the cataloging system and the, the visuals, et cetera, et cetera, is that as soon as it's there, it's ready for use. So as soon as, I, as soon as the books are there, they'll be usable. Can I add yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to be building the new complete lab library as soon as possible. And if anybody in the interim has a bunch of dry square feet where they would like to shelve their books to have an interim presence, we would welcome that, let us know. Um, and uh, the research collection is the main focus of this talk, but we also have a community uh, lending collection, uh, the front of which is freely available at GoCan. So if people just want to grab one of the great books and that is the 
I, I don't know if you heard. With her. I don't know if you caught the, caught the part about Sorry, Ghost Town, right. but the, there is a lending library right now in Ghost Town, so of paperbacks that are all devoted to science fiction and come out of Clute's library. And down the line, um, once this library is, is established, and probably before with a physical move, um, I'm hoping very much that we can persuade a collector of my acquaintance in England to convey his collection to the overall library. His collection is all but 12 issues of every science fiction, fantasy, and horror magazine published in the 20th century. It's a vast co collection, and it's in immaculate shape. And, we're, and I'm very much hoping to get it, because it complements perfectly what I have, because I had no magazines at all. Uh, well, that was a dis collecting decision which was right or wrong, but it certainly at this point seems to be really, really clever of me. <laughs> yeah, I have a silly question for each of you. I'm wondering if each of you have a favorite book from a while ago in the genre that happens to be kind of close to what's happening now. <laughs> Got it right, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'll, I'll go with uh, a book that a friend of mine wrote, uh, Lee Constantino, who's, uh, He's, he's, he's also in that uh, new collection that I just mentioned with Madeline Ashby and Margaret Atwood. Uh, but he wrote a book called Pop Apocalypse that came out maybe 10 or 15 years ago about a reality TV president and the world on the brink of Armageddon. And uh, you should all go out and buy it. It, the author's name is, uh, his, his first name is Lee, and his last name is Constantinu, with a K. Uh, and uh, you can, he, he, he uh, works, teaches at the University of Maryland. He's a, a, a scholar as well as a science fiction author. Uh, and a wonderful imagination. Um, I would think of a book way older, so less accurate about him, what's happening in the next nanosecond. Um, Richard Jeffries, 1885, published a novel called after London or Wild England. And it is um, a post-disaster novel in which um, not rising seas, but some other calamity has drowned London and changed the rest of England into a vast, very entrancing archipelago. And take away the word entrancing and take away the actual water, you have a portrait of England today. <laughs> You know, Ed, I have a, a, maybe you could comment on this. We were talking about this at dinner where the archive could serve as a magnet for a lot of different kinds of research in different academic institutions. And I wonder if you could just sort of riff on that for a second. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic idea uh, because uh, met, there are many people out there who are thinking intersectionally and science fiction is also a very intersectional thing. It's drawing from technical literatures, it's drawing from uh, other kinds of, of writing and the creative arts, and it tends to attract people who think about the world in, in productively weird ways. And uh, those people often need a place to hang out and meet one another because it's not always, always immediately obvious how you find one another. Uh, and so uh, this is something that the, the center that I run at ASU does in some ways, but uh, I think that, you know, our capacity to do things like that is fairly limited and the world needs more places like that and I hope this could become a place like that and connect these ideas more directly to ecology, the environment, sustainability. Um, this ties in, in to sense to my cataloging of the, um, of the collection to date. Um, I had a long and interesting conversation today with Joanna Spindler. I don't know whether you're here now. I can't see properly. And she made the very acute suggestion that at least the nonfiction part of the collection be properly um, cataloged in terms of modern um, um, <coughs> data processing, um, um, those slide sheet things, whatever they're called. Um, this is all beyond me in a sense, but I think probably the nonfiction side of a collection like this would be very, very usefully made 
more widely available on, on, the, on the net for researchers to, to decide whether or not they wanted to, to actually make any physical visitations. So that was a very good conversation today. What are your opinions on the book, The Three Body Problem? Do you think it's perhaps too human compliant? <laughs> well, um, not everybody reads every book. And I've never done more than read about the book. And it would be impertinent to really say anything, except, yeah, I suspect that underneath it all, there is a, an interesting um, um, parlay of, of what I've been calling the Homo sapiens compliancy. As it happens, I'm reading the third book in that trilogy right now, so I'll, I'll wade deeper into dangerous territory. But uh, I, all, all I'll say is the one thing that I, we, that, thank you for the question, uh, that I, I wish we'd had more time to talk about was uh, whether science fiction really is a product of the West, whether it really is an, an American and a European literature, or, or maybe it was that once, and now you know there is a Chinese science fiction. There are other uh, global and uh, local science fictions uh, that are emerging. And I found the, the, that novel really fascinating, not so much as this, I mean, it was, it's a very interesting science fiction novel, but also fascinating as a, as a novel of Chinese science fiction. And I felt like I was learning something really interesting about uh, the genre in this other context of the present. Uh, yeah, I think for uh, many, for several centuries, what eventually became called science fiction, because the term, which is not actually a very good term, speculative fiction would be better. Science fiction implies that it's stories about science, but it's stories, um, speculative stories about the world, as I, as I defined it. Um, very, very clearly was part and parcel of the Western European experience of expansion and control and triumphal inventions. and. For that reason, it seemed to be European and eventually American until well into the 20th century. But certainly the definition I had of Fantastica, which I passed on very, very quickly, um, is not restricted to Europe. It's restricted, restricted in the sense of the, the, first, the first focus of its lens is, is the planet. And it's, it's very obvious that um, as soon as the world became more complex, which took various world wars and convulsions to make audible to us, um, that science fiction, speculative fiction, would be written naturally by um, citizens of a wide range of countries and a wide range of viewpoints. Um, the most natural kind of science fiction of a planetary nature, of course, is science fiction where the technology is high. Um, that's just a kind of inescapable burden that the genre has to wear. Um, there's not a huge amount of African science fiction, and you should probably call it something else within the remit of fantastic, but not speculative fiction of this particular sort, because it, 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 deals, with, uh, it deals with what we have never had to deal with generically with any persistence, it deals with being invaded. It deals with the consequences, the creation of whole societies and magic societies and, and vibrant worlds out of the experience of being trampled upon. And the Western world hasn't been trampled on, not yet. We trample upon each other, but we have not had the condign experience with J.H.G. Wells told us was exactly what we should be experiencing in the War of the Worlds. I've got uh, uh, a question that uh, occurred to me as what you were talking about. Uh, this having been a, uh, a Western literature and uh, as it's diffused into the rest of the world, are you seeing uh, different desired uh, outcomes uh, in this new literature from outside of the West? So I don't think I'm well read enough to know the answer to that question yet, but it's one that I'm very interested in as well. Um, and I think that uh, it plays into uh, a, a number of related issues. The, 
the, the problems that we have now, the biggest problems are, are really global. You know, they're global not just in their complexity, but also in that they require uh, a much more diverse set of conversations between people in many different countries in order to have any hope of solving them. And so I think that the question you're asking is very important for that reason. Uh, science fiction has for a long time played this role of inviting not just each reader individually, but you know, a whole collection of readers of a, of a really important book like you know, uh, War of the Worlds. It invites all of those people to, to inhabit the same imaginary space. And that's a very, very important thing to do because that allows you, that gives you a vocabulary. You might completely disagree with what you're reading, but at least you can talk to someone about it and it poses this thought experiment that you have to wrestle with. So I hope that science fiction will play some role in this sort of real world issues that we have today uh, in, a, in exactly that way, exploring whether the genre has a completely different sort of uh, instantiation in, in say a country like China. But, yeah. Um, what um, I'm finding as the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction matures, because most of its coverage of the English language is basically a, achieved and is in a state of constant revision, but not constant writing of new, new entries, is that as we change the focus to other, other literatures, um, we are forced and should be forced, and it's our fault in a sense that we have been guilty of this, to rewrite what 30 years ago was a satisfactory entry on African science fiction and now create maybe 15, 20, 30 entries on different science fictions in different countries in the continent of Africa. What that, that's one thing. The other kind of discovery one makes is that when one begins to explore some of the more, as it were, visible individual countries, visible in historical terms, or not necessarily in the future, like Japan, one finds through my colleague and friend, um, and Liz's colleague and friend, Jonathan Clements, who um, speaks and translates both forms of China, Chinese and Japanese, and has been writing a huge number of entries for us on Japanese science fiction in particular, those 100 entries, 110 entries on Japanese science fiction unpacked a fractal complexity of science fictions. It was not a discovery of, of, of how to translate American G.I. Joe um, comic books into manga. It, science fiction existed in Japan um, as part interestingly enough, of, of the whole complicated argument and discourse between Japan and the rest of the world in terms of military control of itself and other countries and in terms of, of cultural autonomy and in terms of conquering other countries. The a range of science fiction in Japan is enough to keep somebody who reads J Japanese busy for, for decades. And this just unpacks all over the world. And we don't know where it's going to stop, except that we know that it won't ever really stop. I have one last question from this gentleman here. Well, this is a, just a technical question, and you may have answered it. Will the books in the library be text searchable so that if a researcher wants to find out what people have thought creatures on Venus eat, they'd no. be able to look? The, an the answer is, is no. Um, I've, I've, never I've never created it over the years as an individual in terms of that particular kind of information-based um, research cataloging criteria. And it's rather late to start now because um, it's too late to do it. It's 12,000 books, but the... Google might the, do it. Sorry? Google might be willing to do it. I don't, I don't think, to be honest, it's any longer really necessary because every individual book in the library can almost invariably be linked to the kind of discourse you're looking for and back and the other way around. Um, we, 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 the focus on, on the on the individual books and the individual narratives of, of, of careers, except um, with the nonfiction, 
um, is, is something which has become now um, not so much of a liability as a concentration so that um, certainly if I'm going the other direction from the collection to the, the whole world, if I have a, a, I list a particular book and I only list the first edition and only the publisher, etc. of that edition, but anyone now can go to the bottom of the entry and link to the International Science Fiction Database on, uh, on that author and find a rather considerable amount of additional information that I would not wish to bother putting into my entries. I'm not going to put ISBN numbers. All I have to do is hit the link and find them. And so there, there's a way in which the ocean in which we exist and float is hugely, by huge leaps and bounds, becoming interactive in the way that you're describing being a desideratum. So we, 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 don't, we don't need to do it. Our servants will do it for us. Great. Um, and in order to access the science fiction encyclopedia, you, all you got to do is go to telluridinstitute.org, and there is a link to the library, the new library, and within that is links to Clute and the science fiction encyclopedia, as well as work by Ed Finn. I want to thank you so much. Uh, give a warm thank you to our guests, Ed Finn and John Clute. And I want to encourage you to go to two places. One is down to the bar and make sure that we hit our quota. And the other is over to Ghost Town and check out the, uh, the free lending library there. Okay, just across the street, basically. Thank you very much.